So, uh, yes, my name is uh, Maria Lundqvist and I am a finance, uh, financial advisor at the Innofin advisor team at the European Investment Bank and I am based in uh, Luxembourg. And my background is within the EIB for a couple of years, but more from the technical side, um, where I, for the past four or five, five years, um, have been working uh, in our technical department, where engineers and economists, they work together to assess uh, investments. And I've been particularly uh, at the appraisal phase of uh, corporate loans uh, for investments in innovation and uh, digital technologies. And my expertise is uh, with an area of the area of innovation, digitalization and the digital uh, transformation of uh, industry. So, in fact, actually more traditional industries uh, such as uh, steel making and this type of uh, dirty or heavy uh, industries. Um, which are right now going through a tremendous uh, decarbonization and digitalization process. So industry 4.0, IoT, machine to machine, machine to human, and the, more in general, the integration of uh, cyber physical um, space. So that's a little bit uh, where, where I come from. And uh, right now in my current position, I work more and more on the, the cybersecurity front, uh, digital and deep tech more in general. And we, we do have a lot of exciting work uh, going on uh, exactly in this area right now. And I will come back to that, uh, of course, a little bit later. Um, but in terms of then in terms of direct financing, I am most familiar with debt and venture debt uh, type of uh, financing. In case you would have any questions afterwards, but now I'm working on the financial advisory side. Um, so. Now, let's see if I can switch this one. Yeah, so my idea for, for this morning is uh, to decrypt the EIB and yeah, to, to really do that. Um, and uh, I will start by giving you a brief overview of the EIB and the financial products we offer, diving deeper into the venture debt product, uh, our innovation finance advisory service, what we do in my team, um, and the role of the bank in the cybersecurity sector with some projects um, projects we have financed and uh, what we are doing there. And I will also touch uh, a little bit on what we do within uh, the digital economy more um, uh, broadly. But let's start with a little bit of a history lesson. So if we go back some 2000 years in time uh, when uh, encryption uh, made its entrance by no one less than the famous, famous uh, Julius uh, Caesar and the Caesar cipher, um, which has been said to be a great introduction to encryption, decryption, code cracking, and yeah, in the longer, yeah, where we stand right now in cybersecurity. And in fact, it's actually a simple um, substitution cipher, which replace each uh, original letter with a different letter um, in the alphabet uh, by shifting it uh, a certain amount, amount. and uh, Julius Caesar, he preferred uh, three. So, in order to wake you up, I decided to do a little uh, code uh, cracking challenge. It uh, won't take you long to solve this, or maybe it will. So I'll give you a couple of seconds if you can uh, can guess what I have in mind. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So now I think we can uh, start since we now know what language we speak uh, the same all together. So, the European Investment Bank, the EU's hidden giant. So that was uh, a title of an article that was published a few years back, which uh, started something on the lines of uh, safely hidden in the woods of Luxembourg. It's one of the world's biggest and most uh, peculiar banks. And the EIB headquarters, a 13,000 square meter curving glass roof, rise above the Kirchberg Plateau in uh, Luxembourg. And uh, yeah, let's see actually what what uh, we offer. Uh, so, the European Investment Bank, we are the lending arm of the European Union, and we are the world's largest multilateral lender and the biggest provider of uh, climate finance. 
and we work closely with our institutions, EU institutions, and worldwide as well, but in particular the EU, um, to foster a European integration, promote the development of the EU and support EU policies in over 140 countries uh, around the world. And approximately 90% of our lending is within Europe and the remaining 10% outside. And it's governed by the now 27 EU member states. And overall, the bank contributes to the realization of investment projects that further the economic, social and political priorities of the EU. And it was established in 1958, so by now uh, more than 60 years of experience in financing projects. And today we are around 3000 staff and not only finance professionals, but also engineers, sector economists and uh, social and uh, environmental experts. And our activities are focusing on the four uh, priority areas, very broad, which is um, the first one, innovation and skills. Then we have environment, infrastructure and SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. And in 2019, our total lending uh, volume reached 63.3 billion. And uh, these volumes are somewhat equally split uh, between the priority areas between 14 and 16 each, uh, except for the SMEs, which uh, amounts to 25.5 uh, last year. So then what do we actually offer? It's uh, lending, blending, advisory, guarantees and equity. And I will come back to this uh, a little bit later and I will particularly focus on yeah, the lending side, blending as well and advisory and equity. We do not provide uh, direct equity, um, but rather through intermediaries. So here you see uh, an overview of the EIB group uh, financing instruments that we provide. And together, the EIB group, which consists of the EIB, the European Investment Bank, and the EIF, the European Investment Fund, um, we have financial tools that basically cover the entire uh, cycle of a company, um, from seed stage to startup, scale up, SMEs, mid caps, and the larger corporates as well. So if we look uh, over the life cycle of a company at the very early stage, um, this part is covered by the EIF, which takes an um, indirect approach, investing in VC funds, tech transfer funds, business angels, and uh, yeah, ma many other type of similar ones. So then it is actually the counterparty that supports the startups uh, and the SMEs. So it's in indeed an uh, in indirect approach. And then when we move uh, beyond the very early stage, when a company starts uh, raising capital from institutional investors. So here the AB more directly enters the pictures with the, um, our venture debt or quasi equity type of financing, which is an instrument that is supporting growth and scale up. Uh, coming into this second valley of death when uh, the company needs additional funding for yeah, growth and scale up. And this can also be used as a bridge. Um, through the transition from equity to more traditional uh, bank financing, uh, commercial loans, and and then uh, yeah, SMEs and mid caps, and when it comes to yeah, large companies, and here we tackle in particular the innovation gap for large companies, um, including loans for R and D support for developing new projects, and uh, also on the more national levels and the larger organizations for global loans uh, through through other banks. So now you also saw a little bit uh, on the background where our venture debt uh, product uh, fits into the EIB financing offerings, offerings and I will explain a little bit more about this product because indeed it's quite particular and uh, many of the participants here might might find this uh, interesting. Um, yeah, uh, just some background. Um, so, I mean, at, at some point during a company's uh, startup journey, you, you want to move from equity to more debt type of financing. And as you saw on the previous slide, the second value of death, and here it's actually where the EIB 
uh, venture debt uh, can play a role. And this product is, um, is in fact, uh, fairly new. Um, it came out of the famous uh, Juncker plan under the European Fund for Strategic Investments. And the key point here is actually that it differs from uh, normal uh, startup financing uh, of the EIB, which, as I mentioned, go through intermediaries. And here we provide um, direct fin financing from uh, the EIB. And we are still looking for high growth uh, companies, uh, but that uh, have some kind of proven uh, technology and business model. So that are on more sustainable growth paths and uh, yeah, where the company has typically raised at least series A, typically series B, C uh, as well. And we are supporting companies that are innovation driven, technology driven and all of overall this uh, product or what we are doing here is to close the innovation gap in Europe. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a well known fact that venture uh, financing as such is uh, is first of all, a driving force of entrepreneurial and innovative activities, but also compared to the US and Asia that Europe's venture financing market is uh, much, much uh, smaller. So this will often force uh, companies to move uh, to ecosystems where they have better chances to attract the capital they need and grow more quickly. And this is, of course, something that we would like to, to avoid here in Europe. So then who is the venture debt for? Yeah, as we are indeed looking for innovative companies with the broad definition of innovation we have, we have, yeah, at the EIB. Um, and uh, you are a startup or a mid cap with less than 3000 employees. And uh, here also on a high level um, eligibility criteria, if you have a strategic shareholder, which itself is a larger, larger corporate, that owe more than 25% of your company, then you are not eligible. So it needs to be somewhat independent uh, company. And uh, as mentioned, you have typically also raised Series BC, um, but here it's it's much, much flexibility. And sometimes we can even look into companies that only have raised Series A. It, it very much depends, but a guideline since this product is it offers uh, financing between 7.5 up to 50 million euros so a rule of thumb is that uh, we would like to see that you have raised at least 7.5 million in equity before and uh, since in this case the eib itself we are doing the investment so we also look into all other uh, criteria of a company such as business model management team corporate governance and the investments needs to be located in the in the European Union, and it's fine to have other investments and operations outside, uh, but those costs uh, cannot be supported by this uh, this product. So then, when it's uh, the right moment to finance with the venture debt, and uh, as mentioned, it's suitable for companies in scaling up phases. For example, from pilot to mass manufacturing for further development of product services through R&D or through international expansion. And it's clearly seen as a growth capital. So it's all about supporting the growth of the company at, uh, yeah, at a stage where there are some signs of uh, proven uh, technology. So the ticket size, they vary between 7.5 and 50 million euros, and we only finance up to 50% of the total uh, investment cost or the investment plan, which means that we need to see at least uh, a 15 million over a lifespan or time period of three up to four years. And uh, it's based on an upfront commitment of the full amount and the gradual uh, disbursement, as you can see here also in the, in the figure. And it's, uh, it provides long availability, typically 30 months or longer. And uh, each, um, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, each trench is dispersed um, along the way. And uh, it's uh, trenched in a way that it's linked to company milestones, which we set up together with the, the, the company. Um, So what have we then actually financed or what companies do we have in our uh, venture debt uh, portfolio? 
this is a, definitely a non-exhaustive list, but um, it's a broad range of companies, uh, as you probably can see, active in various sectors uh, from medtech, fintech, cleantech, software, fiber optics, and uh, yeah, ma many, many more. And perhaps you can uh, spot some uh, cybersecurity companies here. Uh, I will come back to them later, but uh, Nexus, uh, Clavister, Quant, um, and a few, a few others. So let me move to the part in the bank where I am working right now, which is the innovation uh, finance uh, advisory team, which is sometimes we say in the AB, we provide lending, blending advisory. So what do we actually do uh, when it comes to uh, uh, advisory? So in addition to financing um, the, the EIB, um, we provide technical assistance and advisory services for innovative uh, projects. And in uh, cooperation with the European Commission under the Innofin uh, Advisory Programme, the EIB provides guidance to innovative uh, companies uh, on how to structure research, development and innovation projects um, to overall improve uh, access to finance. So Innofin advisors such as myself and my colleagues, uh, overall our aim is to support EU leadership in specific fields of uh, innovation such as um, space, deep tech and uh, supercomputing technologies uh, which are set to shape the future uh, of, of Europe and more, more globally as well. And uh, we help to provide insights into market needs uh, to find gaps and failures uh, from both a project financing and an EU policy perspective. And uh, I think maybe I will skip to show you this uh, movie due to some IT issues. I don't want to <laughs> don't want to risk anything. So instead, you will you will hear my beautiful voice. Um, but overall, what we do is yeah, indeed. So we we guide our clients on how to structure um, R and D projects to improve um, access to finance, and uh, this service um, aims to help them to capitalize on their strong points and adjust elements uh, such as their business model, um, governance, funding sources and the financing structure to improve their access to finance. And in the long run, this um, increases the, the chances of their projects uh, being implemented. And we also provide advice to improve investment conditions uh, through activities which are non-project specific. And yeah. So our work can basically be divided into two or three types of activities, which are, as I mentioned, product advisory. Then we have the horizontal uh, side, which uh, typically consists of various market studies. Um, and then also um, investment platforms, or we call it ecosystem development, uh, but typically takes, takes the shape of um, investment platforms. So on the, I mentioned on the project advisory, which overall aims to improve the bankability and investment readiness of innovative or complex uh, projects uh, that, yeah, many of them require substantial long-term uh, investments, but that's a problem if the investors themselves just have a short-term uh, horizon. So we are trying to, to bridge this gap. And on the horizontal activities, the thematic and the market studies, there we provide um, advice to improve the investment conditions for access to finance for various uh, research, uh, development, innovation uh, sectors and overall aiming to improve the framework conditions for financing. And we try to develop a business case uh, for new financing mechanisms in uh, RDI sectors. And we do this by preparing studies to identify market barriers and funding gaps and, uh, for example, access to finance studies for AI blockchain, we are now um, just about to release one, um, 5G, key enabling technologies, uh, deep tech. I will also come back to this very, very soon. And on the ecosystem development, which can be in the form of um, investment platform forms, um, 
So here we are aiming to transfer uh, the lesson learned uh, into more actionable or implementable uh, solutions that have a real impact on, on our economy. So indeed, these activities aim to leverage market studies to identify the funding gaps and where uh, necessary also recommend internal EIB managed instruments and or broader investment platforms. So here we can support the setup, the design of such, uh, such platforms. And just to mention a few of the, the dedicated the thematic investment platforms that we have helped to set up is um, under the Innofin mandate, uh, Infectious uh, Disease Financing Facility, IDFF, which has been a key player for the bank now uh, during, during this crisis, um, but also European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, and under the European Investment Fund, uh, AI and Blockchain, which now, or I think actually it was yesterday announced, uh, its first uh, six venture capital funds under this, uh, it's called Innofin uh, AI and Blockchain Pilot. So there were new, new agreements with the tech equity funds in uh, Austria, Germany, Finland, Luxembourg, maybe in the Netherlands as well, which uh, are expecting to bring some 700 million to tech uh, companies uh, across Europe. So here you can see a little overview of the expertise of the innovation finance advisory team and the, the studies that we have uh, produced uh, so far. Um, and you can see a broad range of activities and the particular within the digital field, uh, we have two studies on the key enabling technologies, one from uh, 2018, I think it was uh, financing the deep tech revolution and how investors actually assess risks in um, CATS technologies and also access to finance condition for, for CATS companies. And then we have uh, two on the digitalization of SMEs, where, which were they were done uh, based upon requests from uh, Ireland and one also from Portugal. And this summer we published uh, financing the digitalization of small and medium sized enterprises, uh, the enabling role of uh, digital innovation hubs which uh, in, in particularly uh, look into the role of uh, digital innovation hubs. And on more specific uh, digital technologies on photonics and the microelectronics and on HPC uh, high performance computer uh, or supercomputing uh, we also have. And we do have quite a bit of ongoing activities as well, which which are very soon to be published. Uh, one on 5G, uh, very, very high on the agenda right now, and also on AI and blockchain. And a little bit further down the road, uh, maybe towards, yeah, in, in half a year or so, but we have an upcoming, a quite exciting uh, upcoming one on uh, quantum technologies as well. So here you can also see a little overview of the what we actually do in the digital economy. So we are advising both companies and the public promoters, as well as the, the market studies that I just uh, mentioned. And if you look at the supply side limitations um, combined with the demand demand side limitations, we we it's a, it's a common um, common findings we see in our studies that on the demand for financing it's typically on the it's high capital intensity it's long development uh, lead times high uh, technology risk high market risk it, it uh, typically involves complex uh, ecosystem so significant uh, demand for for capital is uh, it's typically hampered by challenging uh, investment uh, characteristics. And then on the from the supply side, it's insufficient uh, risk appetite and limited uh, investor patience. We also see very, very often uh, a fragmented uh, supply of capital and a lack of uh, complementarity across various sources of capital. And the public investment tend to be too pres prescriptive uh, and a very, f very famous one and a very 
um, yeah, this is we see basically in, in all sectors we we are operating uh, the lack of. Uh, uh, common information, so uh, asymmetric information, as we, we say in, in uh, economic terms. And together, this results in funding gaps. And as mentioned, the, the studies that we have so far are conducted within KETS and uh, HPC and uh, all these uh, technologies. So then, if we move to the actual uh, cybersecurity sector, which uh, is, uh, I guess you're quite interested to hear what the EIB actually, what, what we are doing uh, in, this, um, in this field. Yeah, so, okay, actually, uh, the, I mean, one can compare uh, the danger of cybercrime and to forget to add the uh, traffic light and this is um, what is happening right now in cybersecurity. we forgot to build the traffic lights and now we have all these malicious attacks going on and this quote I, I took from a senior technical digital expert here within the bank uh, who deals um, substantially with the um, or primarily with the um, uh, cyber security but when you, when you actually think about it there and our move to, to the digital economy and make a parallel back to when cars uh, started to become uh, widely available on the road. It, it has a point and uh, I mean, road safety and improvements in fertility rates, in traffic accidents, it's, uh, it has been, uh, yeah, <laughs> noticeable. And uh, despite that more and more cars are added on the roads and more roads are added as well. So similar logic can be applied that the more data out there of course the more the more the more uh, or the higher the need for for secure data but yeah so as you are all aware that everything is is going digital and if you look at any industry not of course digital but healthcare transportation uh, telecoms manufacturing the the amount of data, data is is just exploding and yeah, it has to be, be kept secure and the increasing uh, digitalization of people's life uh, create many opportunities for public institutions and businesses alike. But it also opens up new avenues for, for crime. And uh, and yeah, so even if if you right now, as we speak, are working from home on a safe uh, VPN uh, connection, I mean, you, you work, yes, through this, but on the private side, you may be less uh, behind, less uh, encrypted walls. Uh, and what you do in your private life may also easily show, I don't know, political support, religious support, which someone may or may not uh, be able to take advantage of. Um, but. I mean, overall, uh, throughout the now where we are in the in, in the in the crisis uh, times, the, the digital push push has has just uh, been been uh, outstanding, uh, which I guess no one can can say anything about. And it said that today there are a bit uh, more than twenty billion IoT devices. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, a, a clear priority with. A more digital economy is, of course, on the security side, which has been been highlighted in particular now in uh, during the crisis. And uh, I mean, think of it: more than twenty billion connected uh, objects today, and uh, it will only it will only grow. And what we are also seeing is, I mean, cybercrime is increasing. Uh, just to put uh, some some figures. Um, that the cybercrime damages are anticipated to cost businesses and organizations uh, six uh, trillion uh, US dollars annually uh, by next year, and ransomware damage estimated to reach 11.5 billion uh, globally uh, this year and 20 billion uh, in 2021. So almost double in just a year's time, one year time. And the average cost of cybercrime for an organization is estimated to be 13 uh, million dollars uh, per year. And this is this is quite interesting, actually, that 33 percent, so one third of all EU uh, citizens uh, between 16 and 74 years old 
uh, reported having some type of problems with the security related uh, incidents. Uh, I think it was the uh, Eurostat data from, yeah, from 2019. And also, as I mentioned, that the EIB, we are clearly a policy driven bank. So we see substantially increased attention uh, by policymakers. And I think there are a bit of quite a few speakers from the, the, uh, the Commission here, so I will not uh, go into this deeper. But cybersecurity is really becoming a priority for, for the EIB. Yeah, and clearly Europe is lagging behind. I, I like this figure. It's uh, it's it's in some ways it's, it's horrible to see, but it's uh, it's quite interesting. And of course, it's not uh, exhaustive, but uh, it gives a little. Uh, when you take out all the companies and just keep the the European one, the landscape becomes uh, small. So, what do we actually then? What are we eligible to support uh, when it comes to cybersecurity? So, cybersecurity um, itself. It's, uh, it's in its own right, it's uh, eligible for the bank uh, under our innovation and skills program. So here investments typically include the, the strength and the resilience of critical infrastructure network uh, networks against um, cyber attacks, so development of cybersecurity technologies or the purchase of equipment, and particularly in the sectors of telecom, energy, transport, uh, financial healthcare, and uh, our investments, they are on the, they fall under the, the NIST directive and uh, the directive on security of uh, net, uh, network and information systems. And they are also in line with the, the Cybersecurity Act. And uh, recently also uh, that was announced in, in the spring this year, the cybersecurity strategy. And then a few years back, we also um, launched something called the European Security Initiative. Uh, which aim to support the uh, Europe's um, the security and defense agenda, and the EIB group we approved this in I think it was December 2017, um, and the target was to to invest um, six billion uh, during 2018 to 2020 uh, in projects in the European cyber, not only cybersecurity, um, but security and defense uh, more broadly. Yeah, so here you will see um, a few of the selected uh, cybersecurity projects um, that's been uh, been financed over the past uh, years with the Swedish companies uh, Nexus and uh, Clavister. You have them, and uh, the two companies are developing more advanced uh, cybersecurity software to stop the, the rise in hacking and creating uh, better uh, identification systems uh, to protect uh, people's uh, data. And uh, both of these uh, deals uh, are part of the European Fund for Strategic Investments, FC. And um, so for Nexus, uh, the bank loaned uh, 29 uh, million to help uh, accelerate uh, its identity and access management uh, products. And Nexus has developed this smart ID technology, which uh, lets people uh, identify themselves uh, visually. So log in, open doors, sign transactions uh, on electronically, and also make uh, payments with cards or other mobile uh, instruments. And so the, overall, this uh, stepping up the fight uh, against uh, cybercrime is, I mean, it's instrumental, and we also understand that from from the bank side. And uh, then we also have uh, Clavister, which is yeah, they're on the top and. Uh, there, it was a loan of 20 million, um, which aimed to help uh, the company to develop advanced cybersecurity software and also hire new computer experts. And the uh, Clavister's uh, firewall uh, products uh, protect the entry points of computer networks to block hackers uh, before they strike. And the company is one of the top uh, cybersecurity firms in, in the world. And uh, I mean, uh, securing network and uh, information uh, systems in Europe is essential uh, to keep the online economy uh, running and to, to ensure its uh, prosperity. And uh, the, the bank is also more broadly trying to, to help digital security across Europe. And on a few years back, it's also signed a deal with uh, 
with the CS Communication and uh, System um, System Group uh, French firm, um, helping industries to uh, detect and prevent cyber attacks, which you can see a little logo there into the to the left, and uh, Quant, which you may may or may not be familiar with. Uh, it was a 25 million loan to uh, to the Franco-German German company, and. Uh, yeah, they develop a search engine engine that uh, provide uh, uh, users uh, private uh, data. And there are quite a few companies as well in the pipeline, and uh, some are quite advanced uh, stage of uh, of the the appraisal phase. But I cannot uh, disclose anything right now. But uh, there are, yeah, as I said, I mean it's, it's a important sector from for the bank. Yeah, and then I will just briefly, you know, towards the end. Uh, so, I mean, cybersecurity is also something we support, let's say, beyond the money and beyond the financing. So, on the advisory side, we have uh, under the um, European um, Advisory Hub. Um, so, I mentioned this European Security Initiative. So, in order to to know what has actually been invested in in cybersecurity, it's I mean cybersecurity is a sensitive sensitive uh, topic, and the uh, information is uh, sparsely available uh, at least on the public side. So organizations are very reluctant to share um, information on their cybersecurity position, and particularly with regards to vulnerabilities, solutions deployed, budgeting, staffing, and so on. So. Given this lack of data and information, uh, we, we hired a couple of consultants to develop a com more comprehensive model uh, based on a statistical approach um, that enable the identification of cybersecurity related investments uh, using several multipliers um, in order to, yeah, to estimate the investment um, based on the, the limited data that is available. And, this was also as an evaluation exercise for the, the European Security um, Initiative. And the consultants, they developed uh, something um, named um, identification of cybersecurity related investment uh, methodology or ICRI. And uh, yeah, the overall aim was to use some kind of estimates uh, to, um, to see how much of uh, an overall ICT uh, budget that goes into to cybersecurity. And behind this um, methodology is the assumption that cybersecurity, there is a component of it in all uh, investments that have an ICT component. And also that a certain range of an ICT budget should be directed to um, purely cybersecurity investments. So, yeah, with other words, ICT investment is used as a proxy for the cybersecurity uh, budget and uh, investment. And this is also a very uh, exciting project we currently have uh, under approval, which is a request that came from the um, the region of Brittany, uh, and also in co collaboration with uh, with EXO. And uh, the there is a clear need for a pan-European cybersecurity uh, investment uh, platform, um, and here they are uh, has submitted an official request to to us uh, through the uh, European Advisory Hub to help with um, uh, market assessment and design uh, the financial structure, for example, yeah, if it would be a fund of funds or co-investment uh, uh, agreement or uh, SPV or yeah, whatever structure can be set up um, to fit the cybersecurity market. And um, here we're also working uh, uh, together with, uh, with EXO and uh, yeah, I think maybe later today they will be a, a good good speaker from there as well. So this is my last slide. The European Investment Bank decrypted the question mark, which means that if you think it's uh, it has been decrypted enough, I, I'm happy. But if you have uh, questions or more uh, specific. Uh, yeah, whatever you might uh, might have, I'm I'm here for for questions. Depending on how much uh, time we have. Yes, we we still have like uh, five minutes for question for the participants. You can use both the chat here on WebEx or the chat on Team. 
So um, I will go for the first question that I read on Tame is like, what's the cost of such an advisory for a small startup by Mr. Gatskas? So you talked about the advisory for uh, for the startup. So how what is actually the cost for such advisory? Yeah. So so here it it uh, it depends very much. Uh, I mean, a, a general rule is that for for private uh, companies, the services is not offered for free. Um, but we do not take. It depends very much from from company to company and how much we are involved. Uh, but for for private ones, it's not completely for free. But uh, on the other side, from uh, the if we get a request from uh, from a public entity, it can potentially it's uh, it's completely for free. But of course, our capacity is limited, so it's not that all requests that are sent to us we can work with them. Um, but it, it very much depends. Okay. okay. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Ayosa. Ayosa, you want to make the question since you're on the stage already? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I wanted to ask because uh, Concordia is a pilot project for the future European Cybersecurity Center and Competence Network. So, how do you see the role of European Investment uh, Bank in the, in the relationship to this to, to this proposal in the future European uh, Cybersecurity Competence Center? I, I see. It, I, I hope that we can play a, a role. I, definitely, I see it 